if you would indulge me a diversion once again from the text that's in your bulletin the lord has just led me elsewhere i'll be reading from the gospel of mark chapter 14 a familiar verse the uh the interpretation i have on it today the perspective the angle that i take is uh it's it's one i'd never never thought of and i've uh, been reading scripture on my own as an adult for a few decades now uh, but i believe it'll bless us hear now the word of the lord mark 14 3 through 6 while he was in bethany reclining at the table in the hometown of a man known as simon the leper a woman came with an alabaster jar a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. They rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're in a sermon series on the season of Lent, the meaning of it, why do we observe it, and how do we do it faithfully. Last week we reflected on The point of Lent being to call down the power from heaven. It's not just a a New Year's resolution reboot where, you know, you used to wear 32s and now you're wearing 33s because of Christmas. Brother Eddie's talking about giving up something for Lent. Let me go back on my diet. If you can work that in, great. But it is far more. The early Christians, when preparing to observe Easter, that is, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, we're doing more than just going on a diet. In light of the resurrection, Jesus had taught that there is more to life than just this life. Heaven and earth are going to meet and create a new heaven and earth, very much like a man and woman marrying. They are the same, but now that they are married, you know, you become very different. And Jesus taught in light of the resurrection, heaven and earth are going to become one. And when they do, both are going to become very different. And so the early Christians believed to see this marrying of heaven and earth, they would need different eyes. It would take eyes that were not so beholding to the power structures of the world that they lived in, that they knew. And so, to prepare for celebrating the resurrection they would observe for themselves the practice of carrying the cross that is dying to themselves participating in redemptive suffering doing more acts of deferential love that is loving in a way that considers the other more than themselves carrying their own cross yes the cross is the vehicle to our eternal abode, but it is much more than that. Jesus taught about the cross that we are to carry a cross. So, in essence, what I'm saying is to have the eyes to see better the resurrected existence that Jesus taught about, they practice their own carrying of the cross. One of the ways we can, in this Lenten season, carry the cross for ourselves is to tear down the idols in our lives, the the things that distract us from God, which we talked about last week. Hopefully you've discerned something that you can remove from your life for the sake of pushing back on darkness. Remove the idols in your life, the things that distract you from God, and repair the altars in your life. The things that increase the chances that you are going to encounter God. One of the altars I would encourage us to repair in our life 
is that of prayer. And I want to reflect on that today. I'm going to say one thing very simple about it. And then I'm going to say one thing that's um, it's, it's just strange. I've never, I've never thought about this particular prayer. Um, but I believe it'll bless us. So to begin with, in regard to prayer, let me say this. Prayer was such a common thing in the life of Jesus that he would often end up missing. The, the disciples wouldn't know where he, where he is. And it was because he would be out praying. Well, eventually they caught on to this pattern of his, and they knew where he would be if he was gone. So, um, so patterned was he that eventually the disciples said to Jesus, Listen, can you teach us how it is you do this? We get very anxious about our ministry. You go away for hours at a time. You come back, and you're a cool cucumber. How do you do that? We don't know where to go next quite often in our ministry. Do we go to Jerusalem? Do we go to Samaria? You go away for a few hours and you come back and you know exactly what to do. How do you do that? And so Jesus listened to this request of theirs and said, okay, let me teach on that. So hear this. If Jesus camped out on the idea of prayer in a teachable way, That means for us that prayer is teachable. And if it is teachable, then it can also be learnable. The first thing I want to say about prayer is one of the main things Jesus taught about it, which is to be more intentional about it. He would tell his disciples, you really need to go into your bedroom, get alone with God, and pray. Don't do it out in front of people just so everyone can see you. But get alone with God, and when God sees you in private praying, He will bless you openly, publicly. Now, I don't think Jesus meant specifically, you must do it in your bedroom. I think His point was, be more intentional about setting aside a time and place. Don't just be casual with it. My experience of my spiritual life when I was just casual with my prayer, which I went through that season, was that it's not that I didn't have a plan for my prayer. It's just that my plan was, well, when I felt like it. And my experience is when you you leave your prayer plan to when you feel like it, you will eventually become um, a foul-weather friend of God. You've heard of fair-weather friend? People that are around only when things are great? Well, when I left my prayer up to when I felt like it, I became a foul-weather friend of God. I would call on God when, you know what, hit the fan. If I was in the boat and the waters were calm and the sun was just right and there was something cold in the cooler, why call on God? But if the waves stirred up and water came over the bow, started getting in the boat, the bilge pump wasn't pumping it out, the boat started going down, then I had reason to pray. But the problem about being a foul-weather friend of God is that when when you call on God, once the storm has hit, well, storm preparation is best served when you prepare before the storm hits, not when the storm hits. We all know people who have a very intentional prayer life. And when the storms of life come their way, they seem to be the most unmoved, the calmest. They seem to have a source of strength that doesn't make sense. I would say it's because they have spent such time with God in their intentional prayer life that they know when sitting in the boat and the storm comes that someone else is in the boat with them. Jesus is also in the boat. And if Jesus is more powerful than the storm then what reason is there to get all worked up? Paul was someone who wasn't very impressive on the outside. In fact, a lot of biblical scholars think he had um, some form of handicap. But he was a strong person internally, and I believe it was because of the time spent one-on-one with God. Be more intentional about your prayer life. It's a very simple idea, and it'll make you stronger in the storms of life. Let me go even further. If you are more intentional about your prayer life, um, my sermons will get better. (laughs) They will. They will. If 
you leave your spiritual nourishment to Sunday, 30 minutes during the sermon time, you're going to starve spiritually. If you've waited all week to get fed, and I'm supposed to feed you for the whole week prior and feed you for the week to come, hear me. I'm not that good. But if you are feeding yourself all week, not only will the sermon get better, not only will you be not disappointed, but you will have been preparing your spiritual senses to hear from God in a way that that will even go beyond what I'm speaking up here. I don't I cannot count the amount of times I've been behind the pulpit and I've said brothers and sisters A B C and then someone's leaving out the door and we're 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 parting and they say brother Eddie when you said XYZ that was amazing. Well I didn't say XYZ at all. But they heard something because their spiritual senses were open and they heard from God. Wouldn't you like my sermons to get better? Be more intentional about your prayer life, and you'll be blessed. Now, being more intentional about your prayer life, setting aside a time and a place is an easy idea. I would like to go into something um, a little more ticklish, and that is exactly what it is you're praying about. There are topics in prayer that can be easy. Praying for your health, praying for your job, praying for things to go well, praying for good weather. Uh, physically or metaphorically but there are times i believe where god calls us to pray for things that are that are not so comfortable not so easy and there's there's a prayer that i I would challenge you to add to your prayer life that will if nothing else spice it up now when i first say this uh many of you are going to be very resistant to it i i was resistant to the idea when 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 i was first introduced to it but if you just stick with me for a second, I think it'll make sense and it, and it relates to, this, to the text. Here's the idea. I encourage you to open your mind to the idea of praying for God to break your heart. Break my heart, God. Consider adding that to your prayer life. Now, breaking doesn't always necessarily mean something completely bad. If you want to ride a horse... And it is a wild horse. The horse needs to be broken. If you want a dog to live in your house, and it has yet to be housebroken, you want the dog to be housebroken, for sure. If you are a kid and you're trying out for a little league team and you get a brand new glove, you want to break that glove in, or it's going to be no good. Uh, If you're a dude and you like wearing boots, you know that the boots don't get comfortable until you break them in. Yeah, so there is something about breaking that is not necessarily a bad thing. David, when he was at one of his low points spiritually, this is in Psalm 51. This is likely after his experience with Bathsheba, when because of his decisions, he had put some distance between he and God. He began praying in Psalm 51, and you can, this is David's prayer. And, and part of his prayer is, God, I know what you want. You want a heart that is contrite, and he says not only contrite, you want a heart that is broken for you. The idea for David is that his heart was likely puffed up and proud with entitlement as to what he deserved as king. Well, that proud heart got him into a tough spot. And so for him, a broken heart is exactly what he needed. And from God, and he was praying about it. In this particular text, it is so interesting to me um, that the lady breaks the jar. It's equally interesting that just a little bit later in this very chapter, chapter 14, Jesus breaks bread and offers it to the disciples and said says to them do this breaking can be good but in hearing sermons on this text i've always heard about how the disciples were so upset that she wasted 
such a resource just on worshiping Jesus and how worshiping Jesus extravagantly is a good thing. And I think that's something to be taken from this text, but, but there's more. Why did this woman have a jar of perfume that valued a year's wages? She wasn't married. What was she doing with that? Uh, biblical scholars say the ladies that, that would legitimately have a bottle like that would be very wealthy married women. She wasn't. If you weren't married and wealthy, the only other people that would have a bottle of perfume that expensive would be women that would need that sort of fragrance for business purposes, if you know what I mean. It would be a prostitute's calling card. It would be an advertisement, if you will. If someone was single and wearing this perfume, it meant something. So for this woman to break this jar over Jesus' feet meant that, in my mind, at some point, her heart had been broken from whatever past was keeping her from following Jesus Fully. She was saying to Jesus in that moment, not just, not just, I'm willing to worship you extravagantly. She was saying, my heart is breaking from this so that it can be fully given to you. Plenty of other people in Scripture needed their heart broken for one, one reason or another. This is not an anomaly. Moses heart was full of fear when God called him to relieve ancient Israel from slavery because Moses thought he was going to be the one to do it all to which God said I am the one that's going to do it you just have to come along and so he had to break Moses heart from the fear that he had Jonah's heart was full of hate in in avoiding his call to take God's grace to the Ninevites. That's why he avoided Nineveh. The, story, uh, the story's main point is not that someone can survive in the belly of a whale if God is with them. That's a great miracle. But the, the, the story, the point of the story, is that quite often God's people avoid what God calls them to do because of the hate that they have in their heart for somebody else. And so God had to break Jonah's heart of the hate that was keeping him from, a, from uh, answering God's call. He needed his heart broken. Ancient Israel at one point didn't want to be the city on a hill, different from all of other nations. They decided they wanted to be just like all the other nations around them, and so they erected idols to mirror the worship of the nations around them. And God had to break the nation's heart of the worship of their idols and re-erect the altars that would lead them back into the presence of God. So the question is, what does your heart need to be broken of to fully be given to following Jesus? Could be some sense of pride, some sense of greed, lust, some sense of gluttony, wrath, sloth, all of us have it. Something. Not only does our, does our heart need to be broken from something to fully follow Jesus and, and therefore should be added to our prayer life. One fellow prayed a prayer about his heart breaking in a different way. He prayed that, that God would break his heart for something that broke God's heart. In other words, he was aware that there were things that that concerned God, that didn't necessarily concern Him. And one day he was subjected to God's heart. His, the fellow's name is Scott Harrison. He lived for years a very indulgent lifestyle. He planned parties for large clubs, and he made a good bit of money at doing it, until one day he got involved with a ministry called Mercy Ships. Mercy Ships is basically a hospital on water that... Um, ministers to uh, places that typically do not have hospitals and on one trip to South Africa he saw some of the strangest infections he had ever seen 
people with, say, lips that were swollen up like cantaloupes, threatening to suffocate the person or keep them from eating, starve the person. He would, he would chase down these people to find where their communities are to see if there was a common thread. And he found that in these communities that were causing these odd infections, there was a poor source of water. He would get a portion of this water and bring it back to the boat and show people to their shock. It would look like thin coffee. It was bad, filled with bacteria and even worms that were noticeable to the eye. And he says, at that point, my heart broke for something that I believed was breaking the heart of God. And so he began a ministry called Spring, which is simply to take wells and dig wells in these areas where there wasn't clean water. So break my heart, Lord, Lord, break my heart from whatever it is that is keeping me from being fully devoted to you is one thing you could add to your prayer life. Hard prayer, but scriptural. Or God, break my heart for something around me that breaks yours. And if I have some resource in my life that, that helps me to live such a, a wonderful smelling existence, break my heart to the extent that I am willing to even give up that resource to minister to what it is that's breaking your heart. So a few questions before we go into communion. In this very chapter, Mark 14, at the end of it, Jesus breaks bread. Breaks this bread. This is right before His body is going to be broken on our behalf. Breaks bread and passes it to the disciples and said, says to them, now do this. What does that mean? do this what is the this is it just once a month take bread and wine yourselves could it mean something else what does it mean or two your prayer life what does it look more like when you feel like it or a time and place that you've set aside to visit with God? Or to be more concise, what does your prayer life look more like? Casual or intentional? Or finally, what does your heart need to be broken of to follow Jesus in a more devoted way? Lord, we give you thanks for the way that, that you taught us in real time through people's lives. Thank you for the willingness of this lady to let go of whatever was in her life and be willing to worship you in such an extravagant way. We pray, Lord, that you would inspire us as we, in this Lent season, continue to rebuild the altars in our lives. May our prayer life be more intentional and may we be willing to pray the prayers that are not so comfortable. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you turn to page 12 in your hymnal and join with me in the communion liturgy.